No, not a single one. No children here. Oh, dear, what a shame. Isn't it a terrible shame that our church doesn't have any children at all? Oh, what a shocking problem it is to have. All right, come down the front, those who are here. Let's sing our kids' time song, Thank You Musicians. And I've been in trouble. Apparently, I've been doing the actions wrong. So can somebody who knows how to do the actions show us the right actions and we will copy you? All right. Off we go. My God is so big, so strong, so mighty. exactly the same, but that's fine. All right. Each week here we read some of the words of Jesus. What did Jesus say? The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus says that everyone can be part of his family, his kingdom, or the kingdom of God by turning away from their sins and trusting in Jesus and what he has done. And what has Jesus done? Well, we're reading 1 Corinthians at the moment, and our verse from 1 Corinthians says, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So we trust in what Jesus has done for us when he was crucified on the cross, and that's what we believe. I was driving along this week, and a little girl said to me, Why do all churches have a cross out the front? And it's true, when you drive past the church, you'll see a cross in their symbols or their names. It talks about the thing that we all hold in common, that Jesus died for us. That's good news. All right, I have this morning a mystery box. It's not a vacuum cleaner. All right, our mystery box this morning is something that I think everybody in this room would have had at one time or another. Any guesses? A toy, a shoe, what do you think? A dummy. Oh, not everyone had a dummy, but all right. What do you think? A zoo. A zoo? A shoe, a shoe, a shoe. All right. Okay, this is something that generally is for children, but sometimes grown-ups get them as well. I'm not taking answers from the back, Malachi. If you want to be a child, you come down the front. If you want to be a grown-up, you stay there and keep your hand down. Any other ideas? Something that children get but grown-ups don't. You don't know? You don't know? Okay. It's something that usually comes just before holidays. Who says tests? Hmm? No? Assessments. No, but it's like that, but kind of. A toy. It's not a toy. Christmas present. Oh, but Christmas presents are coming for every holiday. All right, so if you've got come up to the end of term, you have exams, and then usually you get free time, someone says. A report card is what I'm looking for. So here's my report card. Don't get it every holidays. This is my report card. Yes, I've done well in everything except for gym. All right. A report card. Do you get one of these at school? Hey, okay. When you get through Oh, it's online, is it? Oh, my goodness. Get sent as an email. But your mum or your dad, whoever looks after you, looks at your report card and says, oh, I've done pretty well there. You've done pretty well there. That could be better. Yes? Do you know in the Bible, Paul is about to hand a report card to the church in Corinth. We've been reading the book of Corinth, and he's going through and he's saying the things they're doing well, but sometimes there are things that they need to fix. And today is going to be one of those things. So it's not a very positive reading from the Bible today, but Paul is going to give them some suggestions on how they can do better. Okay? I used to have a lady in my church, in one of my early churches, and every Sunday she'd say to me, That and better will do. As in, that was pretty good, but you could do it better. So the Paul is saying to the church, that, not so good, you can do better. 
So we're going to read it this morning, and let's go. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 17 and onwards. Do you want to read for me? In the following directives, directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. Okay, so he's not happy, is he? In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are div- divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. Good. Click. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay. The big tricky long one, you're right. So then when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat, for when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Gets drunk? Oh, dear. I don't think you're children, so we'll skip over you guys. Can you say amen? Amen. Oh, you don't have to let, don't yell, don't yell. Amen. Amen. I have to click the button. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? Those who have nothing. Humiliating those who have nothing. Amen? Amen. What shall I say to you? What shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. All right. Amen. All right, so that's a bit of a tricky one there, but that's the report card. Paul's looked at the way they do things in their church, and he's gone, you do this, okay, you do that, okay. But then he's got down to this bit and gone, no, nah, you're failing at this. Because when they come together to have the Lord's Supper, some of them are eating lots and lots and lots, and some are missing out. Okay? Some people are pushing in the lines and getting all the cordial and biscuits. And nobody else gets any at the end. That would be a shame, wouldn't it? That would never happen here, would it? Hey, the kids would never push in in front of the grown-ups at the line for morning tea and steal all the biscuits. That doesn't happen, does it? No, and it better not happen again. Paul is saying, when we do things together as a church family, let's do things calmly and politely and kindly and let's share together. Let's make sure everybody gets some and nobody misses out. All right? So I want you to think about that and how we can do that in our church. And the grown-ups are going to talk some more about that in just a minute. That's our report card again. So there are bits in the Bible that are a bit harsh. Can't all be sunshine and flowers. Sometimes Paul needs to say, church, you could do that a bit better. So maybe have a think about how we could do things a little bit better in our church. And if you've got suggestions, you bring them to me. All right. I think that's what, here's another verse for us. Can I have the whole church read this verse, please, from Proverbs? If you refuse to learn, you are hurting yourself. If you accept correction, you will become wiser. Because our report card is not the final answer, is it? You can always go back and try again. Even if you get to the end of grade 12 and have a terrible report card, you could do grade 12 again. No one's stopping you. You could always try it again. And so when Paul says to the church, you guys could do that better, it's an opportunity for us to learn. And if you refuse to learn, you're hurting yourself. All right, I would like everybody to get up and shake somebody by the hand who you haven't said hello to yet this morning. And the first one will say, if you accept correction, the other one will say, you will become wiser. Everybody get up and find someone to greet this morning. Everybody get up. Everybody find someone. If you've come in this morning and don't have a copy of our notes, then please put your hand up and someone will bring them to you. So you can follow along, make some notes. There's some questions there for home as well. Are you familiar with this song? All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. Do you agree? 
You happy with that? You think the songwriter's done a good job? All right. What about could be better? Sorry? Monty Python did it better. No, they did not. Get out. All right. No. How about, though, the third verse of the song goes like this. The rich man in his castle, the poor man at his gate. God made them high or lowly and ordered their estate. All things bright and beautiful. Do we agree with that verse? The idea that God has chosen certain people to be rich and put them in castles and certain people to be poor, to sit at the gate of that castle, and God made them that way, and he's fixed it that way, and it can't be changed. Do we agree with that verse? Some say yes, some say no. Put your hand up if you say yes, you agree. Put your hand up if you say no, you don't agree. Put your hand up if you don't have any hands. All right. Very good. Well, how about this line from Fiddler on the Roof? Heavy, the main character, is praying a prayer and he says, Dear God, you made many, many poor people. I realize, of course, it's no shame to be poor, but it's no great honor either. So what would have been so terrible if I had a small fortune? If I were a rich man. Little, 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 dumb. All right, thank you. That's enough. He prays this prayer and then he sings a song about, God, if only you'd made me rich. And then there are preachers on the TV and in some churches as well telling people that God wants them to be rich, to be successful, to be powerful, to be affluent. What are we to make of all these messages? We're in the midst of our series on 1 Corinthians. We're going through it verse by verse, which forces us sometimes to talk about things that otherwise we wouldn't to talk about topics that otherwise preachers skip over. It's a good discipline for us to talk about what does the Bible actually say. This letter in 1 Corinthians is a letter from a pastor to a church that he loves, where the Apostle Paul corrects problems and teaches some good theology, some good God thinking. And we see that the challenges of the first century church are much the same as the challenges of the 21st century church church. And throughout his book, Paul is regularly pointing back to the centrality of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Can we read the verse together, please? For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so Paul is always pointing back to Jesus, the example of Jesus, what Jesus has done, and he calls the Corinthians to follow him the way he has lived and loved. And in the recent sections over the last few months, Paul has been talking about the centrality of the gospel message, the good news of who Jesus is and what he has done on the cross, and saying that he, Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, who has written more than half the New Testament, has been willing to give up his rights, his power, his culture, his boundaries to become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. And Paul is now turning the attention back to the church and focusing on their activities as a worshipping community, encouraging what he sees as good behaviour, A+, plus, and criticising bad behaviour, D-, minus, could do better. That always annoyed me about report cards. David is an excellent student. He could do better. Goodness me. (laughs) Outrageous. But here Paul says to them, you guys could do better. And it's all building to the great crescendo that we're coming to in chapter 13, where he will say love is the greatest of all things. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love keeps no record of wrongs. But before we get there, Paul wants to deal with some situations in the church. He's dealt with a strange one in the last passage. If you were here last week, without going over all of that again, it seems that Paul is encouraging the men and women of the Corinthian church to keep some uh, of their cultural traditions 
in order to not appear scandalous to their community. They have been set free from the binding traditions of their people, but Paul urges them to stick with some of them for the good of the gospel, to not bring disgrace on the church and the good news. In today's passage, he deals with another cultural issue, but this time he urges the Corinthians to lay aside their customs and take on instead a kingdom of God attitude. Let's read the passage, and then we'll make some comments and try to unpack the verses. So from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 17, Paul says, In the following directives I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat, but when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. And as a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat or drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. Let's look at these verse by verse. In verse 17, Paul is going to a bunch of going to list a bunch of things that the church is not doing well in their worship practices. Not just in this passage, but in ones to come. So verse 17 is kind of a heading for all the few following chapters, or the next two chapters at least. Here are the things you guys are doing wrong. Things in the meeting that are doing more harm than good. Verse 18 says, he says, the church is divided. Didn't click. The church is divided. And we've known that since the first chapters of this letter. If you cast your mind back to all those years ago when we started in 1 Corinthians, there have always been factions. There's always been troubles. Some of them following Paul. Some of them following Apollos. Some of them following Peter. And some of them following Jesus. Different approaches to different teachers. Different philosophies. We've known all that. And Paul seems to mock them sarcastically or at least humorously in verse 19, by saying that the divisions are necessary so God can show which of them is right. But how will God show who is right? By blessing them, of course. The rich man in his castle, the poor man at his gates. But the rest of this passage destroys that idea. The divisions are not God's idea. The supposed blessings of wealth are not to be celebrated as the Corinthians are doing it. Let's keep going. Verse 20, the church is gathering together for the Lord's Supper. But Paul says they're not doing it properly. Verse 21, because some have private suppers, some go hungry while others get drunk. To which a 21st century Christian will say, How on earth do you get drunk on a cube of bread and a sip of juice? Are you wondering that? We think of the Lord's Supper as what we do on a Sunday. How can you get drunk on that much juice? I'm from a non-drinking family. I was raised in the Salvation Army. I've only consumed that I can remember alcohol twice. Once was to see if real beer tasted as bad as a non-alcoholic beer that I'd been given, and they were both terrible and I've never gone back. And the second time was once when I was visiting an Anglican church on a Sunday morning and I took communion and found out that the juice that we always pretend is wine was actually wine. And I got a good gulp of it and I felt all warm and strange for a few minutes until I worked out what was going on. I thought the Holy Spirit was coming to me in a new and special way. No, it was port. But getting drunk in communion? How? Well, what we call communion bears as much relationship to the first century Lord's Supper as a five-second YouTube ad does to a Hollywood blockbuster. There are some superficial similarities, but there is a vast universe between them. 
For all that's important as to Christians, the Lord's Supper takes up a very small section of the Scriptures. What Jesus did with his disciples, the meal, is mentioned in only three of the four Gospels. The accounts and instructions are different in each of them, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the only other place in the Bible that talks at all about the Lord's Supper is right here in 1 Corinthians. And the following passage we'll look at next week is the main section about that. And a few other isolated verses here and there, mostly in 1 Corinthians. This is it. For all the arguments and traditions and theologies and wars that have been fought over the Lord's Supper, we have very little to actually go on. What is clear is that Jesus ate a meal with his disciples. A full meal. A full Passover meal. And Jesus took that traditional meal that tells the story of the exodus of the Hebrew children from slavery in Egypt to freedom in the promised land, and he altered it. He changed a few things, and he made the story about himself. And if you ever have the opportunity to go to a Christian Jewish Passover meal, please take it. It's amazing the depth and the meaning of the various elements But first and foremost, this is a meal, a proper meal. The first century Lord's Supper is closer to a church fellowship meal where everybody brings a plate, which for our new Australians is an Australian expression which means everybody brings some food to share. So if you get invited and somebody says to you, bring a plate, the plate should have some food on it, okay? I'm sure some people here might have been caught out by going to things where they've been told to bring a plate. Make sure there's some food to share. It was close to that. Everybody brings something and we have a big meal together, which we do here every couple of months. Please come and share with us. The Lord's Supper in the first century was closer to that than it is to a cube of bread and a thimble of juice. These people were feasting. And having a good time, or at least some of them were. Because another thing to understand here is the church did not meet in a church building in the first century. There are no such things as church buildings in the first century. They won't be for a long time to come. The church, the body of believers, is meeting in people's homes, in many homes across the city. And they're probably meeting in the bigger homes, which belong to the wealthier Christians, because the bigger homes have got room for more people. But even the wealthiest of Corinthian Christians would be astounded by the wealth of even the poorest of our houses. Hot and cold running water, electric lights, air conditioning, fans, forget about it, flushing toilets. Thank God for them. In those days, the Corinthians are gathered in mud, brick, or stone rooms, a few windows, some flickering oil lamps, and they thought it was luxury. Now, when the first century Corinthians and the Greeks and the Romans had a feast, the wealthy did have a tradition of being generous and feeding their clients, their hangers-on, the poor people attached to the family. It was tradition in those days for a rich Roman or Greek family when they gave a feast to feed the whole neighborhood. But only the inner few get the good stuff. Only the close family and friends get to come inside to the best room in the house and eat the best food and drink the best wine. Everybody else is welcome, but you'll get what's left or second-rate stuff. The poor relations, the workers, a few charity cases would be sat somewhere given worse quality food and poor quality drink. And it's this culture of feasting that seems to have carried on into the church so that when they gather to eat the fellowship meal, the Christian meal, the Lord's Supper, some are gathering in the inner part of the house for private meals, eating a lot and getting drunk. And others are being excluded getting almost nothing, missing out. And while in last week's passage Paul calls on the church to maintain their culture, to maintain their cultural gender traditions for the good of the church, here he challenges their cultural feasting traditions 
for the good of the church. He says, don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. Paul calls on the church to reject their normal practice, their culture, that divided meals between those who are on the inside and those who are on the outside, and instead to embrace the kingdom of God culture, that all are welcome at the table. There's room enough for everyone, regardless of background or economic position. And in Luke chapter 14, Jesus speaks about how his followers are to behave when giving a feast. And then he tells a parable. In Luke 14, these are the words of Jesus. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your family, your friends, your brothers, your sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbours. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you'll be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor the crippled, the lame, the blind, then you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Jesus says, when you chuck a feast, invite everybody, especially those who cannot chuck a feast of their own. And in the parable that follows, a man gives a banquet and invites many guests, and the story is well known to us. He invites many guests But those who are invited start to make excuses as to why they cannot attend. And it goes on, the words of Jesus. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you have ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. The gospel feast is open to all. All are invited, but some make excuses or reject the invitation. They choose not to attend and they have all the excuses in the world. And for those who are in the gospel feast, what have they to be proud of? What is their great achievement? Not much. They simply responded to the invitation. Throughout the Gospels, this message, this idea is repeated again and again, that there is a great feast happening, a big party. The invitation is open to all. We simply need to say yes and show up. That great feast is called the kingdom of God. And we respond when we repent and believe. Are there any questions this morning before we come to our conclusion? If you don't want to ask a question here, my email address is there, my phone number is there. If you're visiting with us, I'd like to stop and see if there are questions in case I've said something that confused, upset, or you'd like to know more about. Yes, Hans. How do you compel somebody to come in? That, yes, that interesting word of Jesus. You really strongly urge them, come on, come on, come on. We've got no legs, we'll pick you up and carry you. I think it's not, about, it's not about forcing people, but it's about strongly urging them, come on in, come on in. We should be doing the same, inviting people, come and come and meet Jesus. Have you met Jesus yet? Come and meet Jesus. I had a knock on the door yesterday from our friendly neighbourhood Jehovah's Witnesses And I think three days earlier than that from our friendly neighbourhood Mormons, uh, they haven't got the message yet that we're not interested. But the only people who knock on my door to talk to me about Jesus are people who don't really know Jesus at all. We should be inviting and compelling and drawing people. Good question. Any other questions? My email? Oh, yes, sorry, Void, I didn't see your hand. Mm-hmm. 
similarities. Okay, thank you, Voida. So Voida is asking about what are the similarities or differences. What can we learn from this passage today? Because we don't do communion in the same way. That's, that's where my conclusion is coming to. So I'll answer your question in just a few moments. You're excellent at doing that, but that's where I'm headed. Um, but thank you. We don't do communion the same way they did in those days. For many centuries now, the Lord's Supper has not been a full meal. We don't do it that way, but it's instead a token, a representation, a sign of a deeper reality. And partly the way we do communion today is in response to the dangers that Paul talks about here and in next week's passage. The church has been very careful to ensure that no one eats too much or gets drunk at the Lord's Supper because the best you're going to get is a little bit of juice. So just to make sure nobody gets drunk, we're only going to give you that much, perhaps. And in some Christian traditions, it's actually only the priest who drinks the wine. For most of the Middle Ages, that was the case in the Catholic Church, that they would do Mass, and then the priest would take the bread and drink the wine, and everybody just sat and watched. Maybe once a year at Easter, everyone would get to have a bit of bread. Strange. The the past is a foreign country. It's a very strange place. So our our traditions are very different to their traditions. But there are other ways the church can introduce false divides between rich and poor and exclude people based on their economic situation. And it takes many forms over the centuries. In John Wesley's day, the rich people would lock their pews. They would have a reserved row of seats in church with a gate and a little fence around it so that the rich people in the village always got to sit in that part of the church, in their pew. And if they didn't go to church or if they didn't like the preacher, they would lock their pew so that no one else could sit there. And this is part of the reason why Wesley and Whitfield and the others would preach in the open air because the rich people in the villages didn't want John Wesley preaching in their church. They would lock their pew so that no one could sit in the church while he preached. So he went and preached in the graveyard next door. We don't have locked pews anymore, although there are certain people who sit in the same seat every week and they might get upset if you sit in their spot. If you want to test someone's holiness next week, just go and sit in their seat before they get here and see how they respond. It's going to be a good test. Maybe one day we'll turn all the chairs around and I'll preach from the sound desk. Let's see how that goes. Anyway, well, you'll all get confused. I don't worry about that. If people like to sit in their same seat, and if that's in a world of chaos and confusion, your seat is your seat, God bless you. But if someone else is sitting in it, maybe just let it go. Yeah? All right. We don't do that sort of stuff so much anymore. But there are plenty of other things that churches do that draw a line between the rich and the poor, the in and the out, those who belong and those who don't. And so we always need to be on the watch for that, whether it's the way we dress, having fancy clothes, fancy cars, having elaborate elaborate hairstyles and jewellery. One of the churches I went to as a teenager, the girls had a tradition of, of plaiting their hair in such a way that they looked like Klingons. You know how Klingons have those things on their foreheads? These girls would plait their head. They looked like Klingon warriors. And you knew who belonged to the church because all the girls had their hairs plaited like Klingons. Talia had it for a little while. It was very attractive. You can't wear your hat if you don't wear your plait. That's exactly the problem from last week. All right. We do this. We make lines between who's in and who's out. And it's dangerous. Do you know why the Amish have beards but no moustaches? You ever seen pictures of the Amish? It's that small Christian group in America. They have these massive beards but they don't have moustaches. Why? Because when they were getting going and separating from the world, having a moustache, you could wax it and grow elaborate long moustaches. And it was a fashion of the day that people would have these massive moustaches. And so the Amish said, no more moustaches. We're doing away with them. And they would shave them off. If you join the Amish, the first thing I would do is shave your moustache. Well, it's 200 years later, and only crazy people have elaborate moustaches with wax in them now, but the Amish stick to their traditions. We need to be very careful about our traditions and what lines they build between people and the gospel. 
James, in his short letter, talks a lot about the rich and the poor. So I was going to finish with a few words from James this morning. James chapter 1. James says, Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. James says it's an incredible blessing to be poor. It's a high position. And he says, But the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossom fails and its beauty is destroyed in the same way. The rich will fade away, even while they go about their business. There is a great feast, a great good news feast happening in heaven, and everyone is invited, rich and poor, old and young, male and female, black and white, and everyone in between. And we are called to be wise as we celebrate and worship. We are called to make room for everyone. The song I've chosen this morning as a reflection is the Salvation Army song, so maybe not many will know it here this morning, but it's a simple tune and you'll pick it up. And it speaks about the reality that in that last day they shall come from the east and they shall come from the west and sit down in the kingdom of God. The rich and the poor, the despised, the distressed, they'll sit down in the kingdom of God and none will ask what they have been, provided that their robes are clean. They shall come from the east, they shall come from the west and sit down in the kingdom of God. Let's sing this song this morning and listen for what the Lord is saying to us today. They shall come from the east, they shall come from the west and sit down in the kingdom of God. Both the rich and the poor, the despised, the distressed, They'll sit down in the kingdom of God. And none will ask what they have been, provided that their robes are clean. They shall come from the east, they shall come from the west, and sit down in the kingdom of God. They shall come from the east, they shall come from the west, and sit down in the kingdom of God, to be met by their Father and welcomed and blessed, and sit down in the kingdom of God. The black, the white, the dark, the fair, your color will not matter there. They shall come from the east, they shall come from the west, and sit down in the kingdom of God. They shall come from the east, they shall come from the west, and sit down in the kingdom of God. Out of great tribulation to triumph and rest, they'll sit down in the kingdom of God. From every tribe and every race, all men as brothers shall embrace. They shall come from the east, they shall come from the west, and sit down in the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Father God, we are looking forward to that day when people from all nations will be gathered together in the kingdom of God as your family and friends. Father God, we look forward to that day. And Father, we want to play our part in inviting and compelling and urging people to come and meet Jesus and have their lives transformed. Father God, if there is something in our church that is not pleasing to you, something that we do that perhaps we've done as a tradition for generations, Father God, I pray that you would point it out to us. 
We do not want to get between your good news and the people who need to hear it. So, Father God, give us ears to hear and hearts and minds to think and ponder. Father God, we want people to meet Jesus and join us in that great gospel feast. Help us to invite and to urge and to make room for everybody. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I invite the worship group to come. We'll sing our final song. If you'd like to discuss these things with me today, then please do so. I'd love to make a time to chat to you about these things because we want people to meet Jesus. We want to grow to be like him. We want to love the way he loves. We want to share his message that the kingdom of God is for all who will repent and believe. God bless you, each one. We're going to have morning tea after, but also we have those uh, things there left from the women's thing, so make sure you go and have a look and take what you need today. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Amen. Thank you, Sarah.